Yeah, I'm glad you got them. Yeah, I'm glad you got them. That's exactly why y'all getting a quiz. No. That's exactly Ooh. why we got a quiz today. <laughs> I hope y'all ready. <laughs> Who's going to pray us in? Who's going to pray us in for this quiz? Get us ready for this quiz. Look at Hosanna. Look at <laughs> I was there looking like, why did I come up in here today? Why did I? <laughs> bro, bro, go pray us in because she late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you since you since you uh pressed the wrong link, bro, we're going to bring us in. All right. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Give me strength. Okay, here we go, ladies. Y'all ready? Amen. Yeah. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you on today. Thank you for giving us this day, Father God. Thank you for waking each and every one of us, uh, us up on this morning, Father God. I ask that you touch each and every one of us, including our family, friends, and those that are lost right now. Father God, I ask that you give them, south, well, bring them into salvation if you have called them by their name, Father God. Father God, I just pray for my my friend that I have lost on today. I pray for her two sons that are in the hospital right now, Father God. As you touch each and every one of her family members, Father God, right now. Touch each and every one of my, touch my children and each one of the ladies' children on this Zoom, including their family and friends, and Father God. And we just thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 It's a <clears throat> It's on the chapter that we're going to read. Did y'all read the chapter? I read it. I'm in the crowd. I did. We're doing John. We're only doing John six today. John six. So did y'all read, read the I'm, chapter? Who said they read the chapter? I did. Awesome. That way you'll be ready for this quiz. Yeah. <laughs> I was in verse fifty-eight. Y'all ready for it's only five questions. Y'all will probably get the answer. I'm gonna make them all multiple choices. Is that is that oh, fine? Make a multiple choice for y'all. I know y'all excited about that. Well, how do I get okay. no, no. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> I got it. I'm a, I'm, I got it. I figured it out. <laughs> Who was iPhone for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody that's probably one of um Carmen people. She doesn't share the link to. Who in here? Uh oh. Who monitoring? <laughs> so is this iPhone four gonna say who this is? Me. It yeah, like Shelly twice. Shelly, you gotta too. unmute your mic, love. It's not that you don't have your sound; you just gotta unmute it. In the chat, she says she don't she know how to unmute. Can. Yeah, if you look at the chat, she says she don't know how. It's at the bottom right. to the left. No, she said it. Right. Right. Oh, she can't get it to work. She can't get it to work. Maybe you need to go out and come back in. Mm -hmm. I'm on an iPhone. Do it and she just, yeah, she might have to go out. And, you did? Phone don't like you today. <laughs> she said yes. <laughs> Dinner is ready. Who said dinner ready? Jane? Yeah, yeah, I'm talking to my husband. <laughs> Get answer. Uh, you don't know how to cook. He <clears throat> ain't good. Please, Shelly, sound is not ready. Her phone don't like her. And you got the volume turned up on your phone, Shelly? She's saying I don't know how it goes. Yeah, she's saying I don't know how it just won't work. Oh, bless her heart. Let's see. That is so not cool. Let me see if I can send her a photo. You on your laptop? If you on your laptop, did you go down to your volume and see? It is up. Oh. Oh, did you when you came in? Did you um come in and say come in with computer audio? Because if you didn't do that, that's probably why you have no sound. So you have to hit um use computer audio. All right. Well, you might have to type in your answer. Everybody else just need to say the answer. All right. All right. All right. Somebody else. Maybe this time. 
Because that one is not muted. It kicked me out of the room. Let's see. Photo. There it is. Can you hear me now? Yeah. iPhone 4. Yep. Yep. Okay. I, I got in on my phone. This is Shelly. Okay. Oh. Awesome. This is you that say iPhone 4. Yes. I'm about to change this. I can know it's you. <clears throat> okay, there go Renika. I was like, I know I saw Renika here now. Oh. All right, y'all ready? Number one. Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is also called the Sea of what? A, Capernaum, B, Tiberias, C, Nazareth, D, Bethesda. B, B. Tiberius. 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 Or oh, do you want us to type it or just yell yeah, it out? Do you just hear, hear We ain't typing this ain't Facebook Live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they about to type. I said they, if Shelly could type, she ain't had no sound, but her sound is in now. All right, so it said, number two, when the people saw the miracle that Jesus did, they said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. What prophet were they referring to? When the people saw the miracle that Jesus did, they said, this is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. What prophet were they referring to? A, Elijah, Elijah. B, Elijah. Moses, Elijah. C, Isaiah, Isaiah, e, Jeremiah, E, Daniel. Elijah. Okay. Elijah. Elijah. Elijah, too. Elijah. Elijah. Wrong. What? <laughs> Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah, I got it. Yep. Wrong. <laughs> Who was it? Wait, wait, wait. Moses. 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 Oh, oh. 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 Wait a minute. All y'all going on the bill for trying to answer before I even get y'all to answer. That's why it was wrong. Repeat the speech. Oh. Slow the list. <laughs> was, that, was that the prophet that um, Moses said he was going to come and the Israelites must obey him? Or was it Moses they were talking about? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. You said what now? I'm sorry. Um, the oh. sorry. Um, was it the prophet that um Moses said they should be looking for, or is he referring to Moses himself? Yeah, they said who the who was it? Who was they comparing them to? What prophet was they comparing them to? Oh, and it, okay. it was Moses. Uh, and you will read this yeah, in the chapter Moses. tonight. It'll be it'll be verse it'll be verse 14 in chapter 6. <laughs> All right. Number three. Why did Jesus walk on the sea? A to escape the crowd. B to go to his disciples. C to show his power. D to reach Capernaum faster. B. 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 What's B? Go to his disciples. See, disciples. to show his power. Yeah. Disciples back. Show his power. Yeah, B, to go to his I'm disciples. Man. Go to the disciples. I'm failing my first quiz. <laughs> but what did the Jews do when Jesus said, I am the bread which came down from heaven? A, they believed him. B, they murmured at him. C, they asked for a sign. D, they left him. E, they worshipped him. Ask for a sign. Uh, they asked for, for a sign. Ask for a sign. I'm going to read it again. What did the Jews do when Jesus said, I am the bread which come down from heaven? A, they believed him. B, they murmured at him. C, they asked for a sign. D, they left him. E, they murmured. They murmured. Who said? Who said they murmured? They started complaining. They murmured. They murmured. They murmured and they asked for a sign, didn't they? They murmured and they left them. Yep. 
Yep. Mm -hmm. B yeah. is correct. They murmured at him. <clears throat> and then they left him. And then they left him. All right, y'all. Trying to throw us something. something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say we must do to have eternal life? A, believe in him. Now, this keep in mind this is in John 6. <clears throat> a, believe in him. B, follow him. C, eat his flesh and drink his blood. D, keep the commandments. E, love one another. Believe in him. Believe what does Jesus him. say we must do to have eternal life? A, a believe in him. B, follow him. C, eat his flesh and drink his blood. D, keep the commandments. E, love one another. A or C. A, a, a believe, believe in him. Drinks the blood. I said A or C. I need an answer. <laughs> that was a. Crazy. C. Drinks the a. blood. Everyone knows. Who said A? Who said C? A. A. I said A. I said C. A. Who said C? A. Because usually people see. light up when they talk, and I ain't seeing nobody oh. lighting up. C. Hey, hey, drink hey, the blood. Hey, That's all hey, I know. Hey. Whoever says C is correct. Hey. <laughs> That's all correct. He is blessed to drink his blood. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, Ali. It's okay. No, I don't feel right. <laughs> so you don't feel right. No, I'm mad. Why? Because I, I should have known better. Oh, how known. dare you learn the truth? <laughs> right. Cut Ali off. She's going on the bill for that one. <laughs> <laughs> That, that bald is, man with the belt. Up. That's Miss Janie all right. day. <laughs> she getting a belt for that time of she mad. You just learned what you need to learn. Tell me what I'm going to do with them, Jesus? What? Tell me out, Jesus. What I'm doing? Love us and teach us. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Hey, lock that door. That is true. Okay? All right, let's get this party started. Get my stuff together. Can y'all hear the music? Because I hear real nice here and I don't know if y'all hear it. Such such soothing music. All right, ready? John ready. 6 and 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Y'all got that right. Now, this story is the this we're about to get into the feeding of the five thousand. Um now remember this is the fourth, this is the fourth sign that John employed um to demonstrate that you know that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. This is the one of the reasons why John is one of the chapters that people always say you should read first when you first come to salvation, because John teaches you about Jesus. John teaches you uh, of his of his signs, John teaches you of how he was rejected, John teaches you how to lay his life. That's why this is a good starter book to read when you come to salvation because you learned everything you need to know about Jesus and so uh, you know John was you remember John was speaking of all the things that Jesus did to show that he was the true Messiah the son of God and this is one of the miracles that's recorded in all four gospels is just the one where he beat the 5,000 and since John most likely wrote to um to provide additional information not recorded um in these synopsis his recording of this miracle emphasized its importance um, in two ways. Well, one, it demonstrated um, the creative power of Christ <clears throat> more clearly than any other miracle, actually. And two, it um, decisively supported um, John's purpose of demonstrating the deity of Jesus Christ, also serving to set the stage for Jesus also. Oh, for his basically. So, um, so interesting enough, both creative miracles of Jesus was the water to wine and the multiplying of the bread, which speaks on the main elements in the Lord's Supper or what we call communion. <clears throat> now, when he said after this, now it was a long gap of time. But he said after this, y'all make sure y'all mute, mute. I hear a lot of I hear talking in them. Background. So, you know, during that time, it was a large gap in the time that was that may exist between um chapters five and six. Um, if if, if the feast 
especially if the feast in chapter five is the booths or the tabernacles. Because, you know, you remember in the first one, it didn't name the feast. It just said a feast. And so we don't know which feast it was. It could have been a feast of booths or the feast of tabernacles or something like that. And so with, with the feast of booths, they're at least six months up on part. They, you know, six months pass, you know, from October to April. So if the feast is the Passover that he was talking about in John chapter five, did a year pass between these two chapters. So um, that's why I said after this, so time has passed. So he said, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. See, these crowds was not following um, out of belief for Jesus Christ. They was just nosy, curious to see how the concern of the miracles that he performed. They, this is this is what um this is why when you when people be saying that oh you could come come to the church for healing or come to the church for miracles and or or the um deliverance of demons people be coming just for their deliverance and they're not coming for Christ and you're supposed to lead them to Christ that's why when you look in the Bible when they everybody came to Jesus for healing that was the foreshadowing saying come to Christ only Christ can set you free only Christ can heal you. And that's why you saw everybody bringing their people to Christ. That was what Jesus was trying to say. You Only I can break you free from what's troubling you. Only I can break you free from demons. Or I can break you free from um, being ill. And so they was following him because of the miracles. They didn't want Christ. But, but either way, Jesus still had compassion on them. And he still healed them. And he fed them. Yeah, Ro, make sure you um you mute yourself, love. So in three, it says, Jesus went up the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes, then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so these people may eat? Now, it says he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Because remember, Jesus already did these miracles. You know, the turning the water, the water into wine and healing people and stuff like that. So now he's trying to see the Phillips, trying to test Philip and see, do, do he know where the, where the food and stuff going to come from? Because he know he's showing you, you know I can make provision. So Philip answered him that 200 um, denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them. So he answered the question wrong. He failed. And Jesus just trying to test him and see, do you, do you remember what I did all this? So you know I'm capable of feeding all these people. But his faith still wasn't there. He still didn't get, he still ain't get the memo. He still ain't figuring it out. So he asked him to test him. Bro, you got to mute your um video, love. Yeah, mute, because we hear a lot of talking in the background. I'm sorry. All right, so um when he said 200 denarii. 200 then you know one denarii is a day's wage right so 200 is enough for about eight months so they had enough for eight months but it still wasn't going to be enough to feed five thousand people in that day so um the crowd was so large um it was that that amount even though it was a lot eight months worth it still wasn't and um it still was an adequate amount um to feed them so one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Now, one thing about the barley loaves in this time, barley loaves in the in this time were crackers. They weren't bread. It wasn't loaves of bread. It was, barley, it was a loaf of crackers. So that means it was even smaller. And so that makes that miracle even much more powerful. And so um, and Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. The number of men was 5,000, not including. Now, now keep in mind, he said the number of men. It was just five. He only counted the 5,000 men. They didn't include the children and the women. So it was more than 5,000 that he fed. Um, It was probably totaling up double or triple that. He was just saying he fed the 5,000 men. Remember, it was a little boy that actually had the um the food to to flip, you know. So um, 
It was more than just men. Now, when you look at the way Jesus fed the multitude, did he charge them? Did they have to pay for fish sandwiches like our churches nope. do today? Yeah. But our churches today, I had you in church all day. <laughs> or you going to be like, and still charge you for a plate. Talking about they making money for the church. Stop lying. When you feed them willingly like that, when you give them what is purpose in your heart, you're going to make them want to come back. Even if it's just for the food. They're going to hear some Jesus. You know? And, and it's unfortunate, but if you're making them, if you're charging them, like you done hemmed them up in church all day, that is not of God. You're, you're basically turning the church into a den of thieves. You're making money off those people. They just gave you money by making them pay tithes that God didn't instruct anybody to pay. And then you're going to take more of their money by charging them for dinner place and then people there with kids. You know what I mean? You got people there with about three kids. Yeah, dinner place, $7. I got three kids. I got to pay for them. I wouldn't even come back. You're supposed to feed them. See, Jesus ain't, Jesus fed them for free. He paid $5. And we charge them 10 people in the church for plates. Dinner plates, if you get a little announcements. Dinner plates, um, $10 a <laughs> plate. At the church, you guys come go by stand, you know, in the giving announcements in church. Now, once you see in the Bible that he charged them for food, these people do not follow Christ, not at all. So it says in 11, Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Now, isn't it ironic that he had 12 loaves, 12 disciples? And on and on top of that, he said the fragments that was left. So you know, after the after the, you know, when the rapture comes, he's he's coming back, he's doing uh tribulation so he can get the remnant of his um tribes. See how see how see how everything links, you know? And a lot of people like to say he used five loaves represents him um multiplying with the new covenant because you know Moses did the five chapters for the Torah. And so a lot of people say that you know that that's coincidental but I'm not you know I can't Prove that, but I know the twelve loaves represent, you know, the fragments of the twelve um baskets is representing the remnants of the twelve tribes <laughs> of what Jesus is gonna be when he come back and he's gonna rule over them. So he says in fourteen, when the people saw the signs that he had done. They said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, this is the, you know, of course, like I said, they're talking about Moses. And this is in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18 and 15. Let me go to it real quick. He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. This is Moses talking. From among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. And so that is who they thought he was. Um, they referred to that prophet that Moses um, was um, talking about. Now, sadly, these comments um, coming right after Jesus healed and fed them indicated that people desired a Messiah who met their physical needs rather than their spiritual needs. Um, apparently, uh, no recognition existed. Um for the need of spiritual repentance. Hey, girl. And, um, and, hey, you know, hey. Bro, you done unmuted yourself again. Uh, I'm sorry, y'all. This is my problem, child, y'all. I'm That's sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm about to mute it. I don't know how I keep getting unmuted. Hold on. So they wanted it. They wanted an earthly, they wanted a political Messiah to meet all the needs and to, to deliver them from the Roman oppression. Um, 
their reaction, um, you know, typically, uh, many who wanted a Christ who makes no demands of them. They wanted a Christ that didn't ask them to turn away from their sin. They just wanted, look, just just heal us. Just be our king. Get us out of this mess. We don't want to do what you want us to do. We just need you to save us from this oppression. So this was a selfish, this is a, so them coming to him was a selfish personal request. And it's just unfortunate. We, we, we got people like this today, you know, come to church because they, because they, because they entertaining or come to church because, um, you know, because some of them will feed you, but they, you know, they charge, but you know, it's just, they're going for the wrong reasons and they're not going for Christ. And the pastors are not helping them even want to go after Christ. They want them, they want them to worship them instead of Christ. So in 15, it says, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. See, this is what's going to this was going to throw Jesus mission off because they wanted him as king. They want dead. They didn't want him to be their savior. They want him to be king. They wanted Jesus to get them out of their oppression, their Roman oppression. So they was going to just take him and force him to be king, basically. And so Jesus had to withdraw himself. Before they took him by force. Now, John and Mark was both talking about this. They both was indicating the reason that Jesus dismissed the disciples and withdrew from the crowd into a mountain alone. Uh, it was because of his supernatural knowledge of their intention to make him king uh, in light of his healing and feeding of them. And so so the crowd, you know, incited, um, they, they was acting like a mob, you know. Um, they was ready to proceed with, like, with these, with these political intentions that would have jeopardized God's will. And so that's why Jesus had a dip because you can't, God's will got to be done. And so in 16, it says, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Now this is the story of Jesus walking on the water. This constitutes the fifth sign in John's gospel designed to demonstrate the writer's, um, which is John purpose that Jesus is the Messiah and Son of God. And this miracle demonstrates Jesus' deity by his sovereignty over the laws of nature, why he's able to walk on water. So he has power over everything. You know, then he can treat the water like a sidewalk. <laughs> That's a God that has power, you know? So in 17, he got into the he got got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. So, um, so this also was spoken of in Matthew and Mark, and indicate that as soon as Jesus had fed the multitudes, he immediately dismissed his disciples to travel to west toward Capernaum, because he already knew what they was about to do. Let's just go, just go, and I'll meet y'all. I'm pretty sure they wasn't expecting him to meet them on water. Because, I mean, I can't, like, they was afraid when they saw him. Because I know I would have been. Seeing somebody walking on water like that. Look, turn the boat around, turn the boat around. Out <laughs> of it, out. Like, you know, so the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Then the Sea of Galilee is almost 700 feet below sea level. So cooler air from the um from the mountains, the, the northern mountains, and the southeastern um. Tablelands, they they rush down into the lake, and then it and it displaces a warm moist air, causing violent churning of the water. So 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 that made it even a more of a miracle because if the water is violent and it's moving, he just come walking all through there. You know what I mean? Yeah, that was scary. To me. And so when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. Now, this 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 reveals that uh, in fear and the darkness, they thought he was a ghost. I mean, keep in mind they were in darkness. I mean, a lot of you gonna fear in the dark, and then you see something walking on water that you know, and you and you human, and you know that's impossible to do. So, I, I'm pretty sure Jesus understood they would be frightened. You know, like I can't ask them not to be frightened. I can't be saying, oh, you you know, y'all need to stop being scared because he you know that would scare anybody. So the son of God, so the son of God who who made the world was in control of, of his forces. And in this case, he suspended the law of gravity. 
And so the act was not frivolous on Jesus' part, for it did constitute a dramatic object lesson to the disciples of Jesus um, to help them understand the true identity as the sovereign Lord over all creation. So even though he created the seas, remember he's created the water and the seas. So if he created the seas, then he, he got control over the gravity of it because he controlled, he the one that made it do what it do. So of course I can control the gravity of it. Go on, walk on. I'm the one created, you know, like, and so, and that's what he was showing. He doing all these signs to let them know I am God. I am God in the flesh. I am Jesus, the son. I'm showing you everything to lay out to let you know that I am um, the Christ. But they said to him, is it I do? But he said to them, is it I do not be afraid? Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now, this word, this right here indicates that another miracle occurred besides walking on the water. The boat miraculously and um, instantly arrived at its precise destination as soon as Jesus stepped into the boat. And see, no one even paid attention to that. You know what I mean? Like, if they were glad to take him into the boat, and then immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. And so that was two miracles that no one is really even, you know, noticing that there was a second miracle because they was not near where they needed to go. They didn't get there until he got into the boat. I, he'd have been my bestie. <laughs> like, you know what, G, let's go on around, you know, like, yeah, you just doing all kinds of stuff, dude. Like, so in 22, he says, on the next, hold on, somebody missing. Hold on, I see him. It says, on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone, which he did. Remember, he sent them away first. So now they're trying to figure out how he ended up in the boat because he had already left, you know? And so, so um, this was, when we get into this, right, starting this verse all the way out to 58, this this discourse that Jesus um is about to um speak on is the bread of life. This is that famous discourse that he um speaks on. This is the key thing when he says, I am the bread of life, which is the first of seven um emphatic I am statements that Jesus uses in the gospel. Now, this analogy of Jesus as the bread of life reinforces John's theme of Jesus as the Messiah and Son of God. Um, now, although John records Jesus' miracles to, to establish his deity, he moves he moves quickly um, to Jesus' discourse on the spiritual realities of his person in order to um, define correctly who Jesus Christ was, you know, not merely just a wonder world, but the son of God, you know, who came to save mankind from sin. And this discourse took place in a synagogue at Capernaum. Now, we get to these next two verses. This is verse 22 and 23. Now, these verses, they indicate that the crowds who witnessed um, Jesus' um, healings and his feeding of the multitudes were still at the original site um, of these miracles because they was um, and, 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 um, out of curiosity. They desired to find Jesus once again. So... Other boats loaded with people from Tiberias, where they had where he had left, and they also heard of the miracles, and they went to go seek him out. Mm -hmm. So twenty three says other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. He don't never answer nobody a question, dude. <laughs> Nicodemus came, well, we know you came from the Lord because of your miracles. Truly, true, I say to you, if you don't, you know, I'm like, he don't, he just keep it moving. Like, hey, look, stop sweating me and get you some Jesus. So he just he don't he don't respond to nothing around here. Boy. He just go ahead on and just point. He only he just go ahead on and expose your heart. Like look look cut the pleasantries. You came here because I fed you. That's basically what he was saying. Stop all that. And so when he said because you ate, now this phrase is emphasizing Jesus' point that crowds that follow him 
were motivated by superficial desire for food rather than any understanding of the true spiritual significance of Jesus' person and um, mission. Remember, he fed them bread. He fed them He fed them food, That you know, because the word is the bread of life. He is the bread of life. And so he's trying to teach them this. So now he's about to teach this. Like, I gave y'all the food, but all y'all was concerned about the food. But y'all didn't want to understand the significance of me feeding y'all the food, of me creating all of that food. So they, they won't get in there. They just want, they like the food. They were poor because he was in Galilee. And you know, nothing good come out of there. You know, so um, they they probably look for him like, Shh, see, we got some left though. You know, whatever, we don't know. So, um, But at 27, it says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Food that perishes. Now, Jesus rebuked the crowd for purely materialistic notions of the messianic kingdom. So although um, the Messiah's kingdom would be literal and physical someday, the people failed to see the overriding spiritual character and blessing of eternal life um, that was, that's given immediately to those who believe the witness uh, of God to his son. And so um, when he said food that endures eternal life, this is him continuing the discourse, indicating that this was a reference to Jesus himself. They still ain't getting it yet. You know, they too, they too, you know, heightened off the food that, that he um, provided for them. And so he says, um, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? The works of God, they thought Jesus was saying that God required them to do some works to earn everlasting life, which they thought they would be able to do. See, they're already coming in with the wrong mindset. They're still acting like they're in the Mosaic law because that's not what he was saying. So Jesus answered them, this is the work. This is the work of God that you believe in him when he has sent. See, this is the work of God that you believe in him. So like I said, you just can't go run up on salvation. I want to be saved. God is the one that's going to put it in your heart to believe in him if he calls you to salvation. So when he says the work of God that you believe, this, the crowd misunderstood Jesus. Jesus was saying, do not labor. Now, this is which this is what prompted Jesus to remind them that um, an exclusive focus on material blessings is wrong. That only work God desired was faith or trust in Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God. The work that God requires is to believe in his son. That's the work we supposed to do. That's the work we do. That's why the scripture says in Ephesians 1 13 again, you heard the truth of your salvation and you believed and then you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of your inheritance. So you need to hear the truth and believe. And then that work starts. Then he begins that good work in you. And believing is really start a person that believes is going to really start seeking after God. Okay, I believe. What what must I do? When you say that, that's that's a done deal. Oh, that's all you had to say. You ain't got to do nothing. You done, you already did it. Now I'm about to do the rest. And that's what people don't understand. So in 30, he says, so they said to him, then what sign do you do? They ain't heard nothing, he said. What sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? And this is coming from the people that just saw him take two, two crackers, five crackers and two fish and, and feed a thousand, five thousand. He gonna, they're going to turn around and say, what signs do you do? I, I can, I, I, you think Peter was saying some stuff. I'd be like, Jesus, why are you even talking to me? You know, <laughs> like they ain't, they ain't this, ain't nothing, ain't nothing swirling Jesus. Like why we, here? you know, because we we ain't got the pace of Jesus. I mean, you sat right there and showed them. You done turned the water into wine. You done flipped some food, and they gonna ask you to send a sign. Let's just go. Let's just go, Jesus. Can we just go over here? To, you know, that's the type of patience I'd have been on. But we thank God for His patience, and so that question demonstrated their spiritual blindness. 
You know, because remember, you're spiritually blind when you don't have Christ, when you don't have the Holy Spirit. So they were spiritually blind. And so, and, and they were shallow and they, and they were selfish. So they wanted to um feel up they they wanted to feel their shallow and selfish curiosity. The feeding of the basically twenty thousand was a was a was wasn't sufficient enough um of a sign to demonstrate Christ's deity. I don't I don't I don't understand. You know, how is it not enough? And so he says, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, this is the crowd's logic, you know, appeared to be that Jesus' miraculous feeding was a small miracle compared to what Moses did, you know? And so in order for them to believe in him, they would need to see him feed the nation of Israel on the same scale that God did when he sent, sent manna and fed the entire nation of Israel during their wilderness wanderings for 40 years. So they would demand that Jesus outdo Moses if they were to believe in him. Remember, they were stuck on just believing in Moses. They're like, Moses was God, you know? And so if you ain't coming like Moses, then you can't convince me. This, these, people, these people were terrible. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father, you the true bread. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. And so the manna that God gave was temporary. And it perished. And it was only a, um, a meager shadow of what God offered them in the true bread, which is Jesus Christ. And he is the one who gives spiritual and eternal life to mankind. It's what he was trying to get them to understand. They, see, this, the, the, like I said, everything that Jesus did always had some significant meaning to what he did. What he was trying to really teach them. So it says in 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And this phrase is synonymous with the phrase bread from heaven. So he said, said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Now this statement, once again, demonstrate the blindness of the crowd. Um, they were thinking of some physical bread and failed to understand the spiritual implication that Jesus was that bread. They still ain't listening. Like these little unsaved people we got now. We trying to explain this stuff, they still come out. You're like, oh my. I thank God Jesus only gave us two times to tell somebody, then after they gotta walk away. You know, because they done did they, this whole time, he's still trying to explain to them, and they still ain't getting it. And so Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, this statement. This is what he said is prompting Jesus to speak very plainly that he was referring to himself. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. There go another. Your salvation is secure, scripture. All that the Father gives me, that means the Father is going to put it in your heart to seek after Jesus. So all that the Father gives me will come to me. If, if God puts it in your heart, oh, you're going to Jesus because he calls you to salvation. And so when he says all that the Father gives me will come to me, this verse is emphasizing the sovereign will of God in his selection of those who come to him for salvation. The Father has already predestined those who will be saved. This is in Romans 8. This is in Ephesians 1. This is in Peter 1. He has already predestined before the foundation of the world who he will save. So once he puts it in their heart, they're going to go to Christ because he had already chosen them and he is the one that's in charge of the salvation. So the absolute sovereignty of God is the basis of Jesus. Um, it's the and it's the basis of Jesus' confidence in the success of his mission, because he know God doesn't fail in nothing that he does. He know his Father doesn't fail, and so um, that's the security of salvation. The security of salvation rests in the sovereignty of God, because God is the guarantee of that. All He has chosen will come to Him for salvation. That's what He's telling them. The idea of um, He says all that the Father gives me, the ideal of gives me is that every person chosen by God 
and drawn by God must be seen as a gift of the Father's love to the Son. So this is a gift. I'm giving. I got you another gift. I got all Melissa for you. You know what I mean? It's a gift for him. So we what we do with gifts? We don't cast out gifts. We keep them. It means so much more when someone gives you a gift out of the kindness of their heart. That's so sweet of you. And you hold on to that. So whoever the Father gives him, God has given Jesus a gift, which is us. We are his gifts. So he ain't going to cast out none of his gifts. That's what he's implying in these scriptures. It's, it's to show his Father's love. And so Jesus receives each love gift. And he holds on to each. And he will raise it, raise each um, to eternal glory. So no one chosen will be lost. The saving purpose is the Father's will, which the Son will not fail to do perfectly. Amen? So he said, for I have come down from heaven to do my, not my, to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He said, for I have come to down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Everybody always say, oh, well, I'm just going to leave it. If it's God's will, if it's God's will, it's God's will that he raise up the ones he has chosen and, and, um, and the last day. So if it's, if it's will, his will is always going to be done. It's that simple. I don't care what you try to do. If he called you to salvation, it's going to be done. When people say, oh, I backslid, or I owe him, I did this, or, or people that have claiming they backslid and then they came to salvation, um, they ain't truly came. They never came to truly came to salvation. That's why it was so easy for them to walk away. Once you're rooted in, once you come into salvation, you're not walking away because then you're saying, God lied, his will ain't going to be done. If it's God's will, then why am why I backslid? Because it was his will. He ain't call you. <laughs> Simple as that. So, and he said, and this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise him up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. He didn't say nothing about it's a condition. Um, Like if you kind of mess up, I can't raise you up on the last day. That ain't what he said. He said, I will raise you up on the last day. That means he going he gonna to cleanse you up and have you ready for to be raised up on the last day. You don't have nothing to do with that. You're supposed to be, that's right, we secure it. You're supposed to just submit to the Spirit, keep submitting to the Spirit. And you're going to do that because that's what God instilled in you. Because remember, he said that the Holy Spirit is going to cause you to keep my statutes and obey my rules. So He ain't, God does not lie. So everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him, this verse, this verse is emphasizing human responsibility and salvation. Now, although God is sovereign, he works through faith so that a person must believe in Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God uh, who alone offers the only way to salvation. Now, however, even in faith, even in faith is a gift of God. So even if you come into, you have to have faith to serve, um, serve God, that's a gift. If you have to have it, that means you got to wait for God to give it to you. You know, he has to, he has to be the one to give it to you. So God, he into, um, so in here, even like like I said, even in faith, even faith is a gift of God. And intellectually, it 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 harmonizes the the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. Um, because to have faith in all those things is impossible for us as humans, but it's perfectly resolved in the um, mind of God. You know, God is the one that controls it because He know we can't do it. That's why the Holy Spirit is called a helper. So he says in 41, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Now, in these next few verses, I think 41 through 50. Now, this, this whole section is going to constitute the beginning of the crowd's reaction to Jesus' discourse on the bread, of, um, the bread of life. And it may be divided into like three sections, like one, the murmuring reaction of the crowd, um, two, Jesus' rebuke of the crowd for their reaction. And then three, Jesus' uh, reiteration of his message to the crowd. Now, the Jews, now in this gospel, the term Jews is often associated with hostility toward Christ when he say the Jews. 
is used ironically to indicate the um to indicate their rising hostility toward their Messiah. And since they harden their hearts, God judiciously um he he uh he had won their heart in their hearts. You know, God is the one that's in control of our hearts. A lot of people say, I ain't you ain't do that. I didn't know God did it. Everything, every decision that you made, that's God just, you know, either letting you do you. And that's what hardening hearts mean. It doesn't mean he purposely hardened your heart to reject him. It's just that he's not stopping you for having a heart and heart. Because he has the power to not have you to have a heart and heart. Because remember, he's the one that brings us to salvation. So if he's hardening your heart, he's not hardening your heart to make you sin against him. He's just not reacting. He's just not moving on your behalf if you're rejecting the Messiah. He's letting you do it. So that's what it means by having a heart and heart. So in the and you remember in the tribulation period, Israel would turn to Jesus as their true Messiah and be saved eventually. You know them twelve baskets. So he said they grumbled. Now the reaction of this um the synagogue crowds to Jesus um statement was the same as the Jews in the wilderness who grumbled against God before and after the manna was given to them. You know, like we said, it was just no pleasing them them, them children. The children of Israel. They just was always nothing pleased them. They always complained. That's probably why the scripture said, do all things without murmuring and complaining. Because that's all that Israel did was murmur and complain. And so he said, when he said, because he said, I am the bread that um, came from heaven, the Jews' anger centered around two things, right? That Jesus said he was the bread and that he came down from heaven, which he did. But the Jews in Jerusalem and the Galileans reacted negatively when Jesus placed himself equal to God. They probably like, hold up, dude, time out. You lost your mind. You are not God. You know, so they just was already rejecting him. So he says in 42, they say, it is not, it's not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? When he said whose father and mother we know, now on the human level, they knew Jesus as a fellow Galilean. So these words are, are re reminiscent of Jesus' words. And, and when he said it in chapter four, a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. Remember he said this in four, um, four and 44. So their hostility sprang from the root of unbelief. And so Jesus' death was in, impending because hostility had resulted everywhere he went. After he did that. So Jesus answered him, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Now keep in mind, he said, no one can come to me. That means you just say, you know, I'm going to go to church and get saved. No one can come to him unless the father draws you. You know, and you ain't necessarily got to go to no church to do it. You can be at home in your bathroom and just say, you know what? I got to find out about Jesus. And you may just start praying to God to forgive me for my sins right then and there. That's him drawing you to Jesus. So, um, and so, um, amen, Hosanna. And so, when he said no one could come unless it, um, the Father who sent me draws him, now drawing him, this is a combination of verse 37 and verse 44. It's indicating that the divine drawing activity that Jesus referred to cannot be reduced to what these theologians um, call um, basically prevenient grace. Um, that somehow the power to come to Christ is allegedly dispensed to all of mankind, um, thus enabling everyone to accept or reject the gospel according to their own will alone. See, people believe in this free will thing. And that's not true. Some people tell you, oh, we have free will. God does not give you free will. Only, only God gives you free will to sin, but you can't, you don't get free will to come to him. That's his choice. But people think that, oh, we got we got we got free will to reject or um accept him. If you reject him, he didn't call you to salvation. At least not now, or he may didn't call you salvation at all. So you don't have the free will to go to him. So people say, Oh, what about our free will? There is none. The only free will you have is to sin. That's the only free will that you have. 
Because remember, God is the one that calls you to salvation. So, but people teach us, they teach this. They think that you have the you have the option to accept or reject the gospel according to your will alone. But scripture indicates that no free will exists in man's nature. For man is enslaved to sin, remember? And are able to believe apart from God's empowerment. People ain't gonna come to salvation unless God is God is the one that do it. We have this mindset on sin, and don't nobody want to do nothing, nothing for God. Everybody wanna sin. Sinning is, is pleasing the flesh, it feels good or whatever. Ain't nobody just gonna be like, you know, I don't want to smoke no more. I don't want to do this. No, I'm just gonna go to Jesus. No, you're not gonna have that. You're not gonna do that. God is in control of that. If God is not in control of it, then you're not you're not gonna see the power of God if you're in control of it. And you're gonna fail at it if you're in control of it. Therefore, God ain't gonna get his glory. And so when he said, um, well, like I said, he's and they, you know, we are able to come to, to believe apart from God's empowerment. So why while whosoever will may come to the Father, only those who the Father gives the ability to um to with um to will towards him will actually come to him. See, the drawing here is a it, what he's talking about when he's talking about drawing. This is speaking on his selection. You know, this is his this is his selection he's talking about. Um, and and that selection, it produce it produces the desired effect. Um, so if the drawing here is a select is a selective and um upon those whom God has sovereignly chosen to for salvation, those who God has chosen will believe because God has sovereignly determined that result from eternity past. So a lot of people saying, I, at first I was rejecting Christ, then, but you believe now that it was God's timing. God, you know, God don't save everybody at the same time. You know, you need a testimony to help win people to Christ too. So you need you need a you need to have you need you could be able to share. Well, I used to do this, I used to do that, and God saved me. That'll have people be like, because you got people that believe that they have control of salvation. They be like, man, I can't stop all this coming salvation. And then you have that testimony where you was the same way as they were, and you came to Christ. So sometimes God delays on saying that saving us because we need that testimony to get to somebody. Somebody might be going through the same thing, and you could be able to teach them. Oh no, God will save you out of anything. You know. And so, um, and so if, that's why I say everybody don't get saved at the same time. So he said, it is written in the prophets, and they they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now, Jesus is paraphrasing. He is paraphrasing Isaiah 54 and 13. But he's doing it to support the point that if someone comes to faith and repentance to God, it is because they have been taught that's why the scripture said, when you hear the truth and believe, you come to salvation. So you have, that means you have to be taught and then drawn by God. And 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 the drawing and learning um are just different aspects of God's sovereign direction in the person's life. So those taught by God to grasp the truth are also drawn by God to the Father to embrace the Son. Amen. So not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. So Jesus contrasted the the earthly and heavenly bread. Right? He was doing a uh, he was doing a distinction. The manna was given in the wilderness, although sent from heaven to help sustain the Israelites for their physical needs, it could not impart eternal life nor meet their spiritual needs, as could the, the bread of life that Jesus offered. That came down from heaven as well, but it came in the person of Jesus, the Messiah. The proof of this, um, this contrast is centers in the, the irrefutable fact that all the fathers died who ate the wilderness man. But if you eat the wilderness, eat, eat Jesus man, there is no death. There is eternal life. And so this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. 
and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now this section, this may be divided into three divisions too, that Jesus and Jesus is pronouncing um, to the crowd's perplexity and three Jesus promises. Now this pronouncement um, reiterates um, verses 33 and 35 and 47 through 48 when he said the bread, um, basically when he talked about the bread of life, he's saying the bread is my flesh. That means Jesus is referring to here prophetically um, to his impending sacrifice upon the cross. And so Jesus is voluntarily, he voluntarily laid down his life for evil, sinful mankind. So the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? I remember I had a, I did a video a long time ago when this dude was saying that Jesus was a cannibal, was into cannibalism. <laughs> the, the ignorance. And someone sent me that video about a year and a half ago or something like that. And, and was saying that Jesus was a cannibal. He told him to eat his flesh. I said, I mean, I know God makes sure that people don't, that don't serve him don't get the memo, but the, the way they be reading stuff is pathetic. It's like, oh my God, these people are so in. So when the Jews was disputing, once again, the 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 perplexity of the Jews um, indicated that they they failed to understand the spiritual truth um, behind Jesus' illustration. Now every time Jesus had given them a a veil, you know, saying or or some type of physical illustration, the Jews failed to see its spiritual significance. And so so the Mosaic law prohibited the drinking of blood or the eating of meat with blood still in it. Remember, this is in Leviticus 17. And so the Jews were unable to go beyond the mere physical perspective where where um they was too they was too perplexed and angry. So then they're thinking like in the because you don't know, remember they had like Moses is the man. So he's like, how eat the bread like to eat his face? We weren't supposed to eat blood, you know, because they're still in the old the, in the Mosaic law. So now they're like, we weren't supposed to be doing this, you know, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. So see, he coming in here lying, you know, so their mind was just, you know. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, Jesus' point was, again, an analogy. That that this was an analogy that has, <laughs> that um, has spiritual um, rather than literal significance. Um, just us as eating and drinking were necessary for physical life. This is, well, this is the point he was trying to make. Since we have to eat physically to live, so also is the belief in his sacrificial death on the cross is necessary for eternal life. The eating of his flesh and the drinking of his blood metaphorically symbolize the need for accepting Christ, Jesus' um, cross work. So for the Jews, however, they, you know, they crucified um, Jesus. A crucified Messiah was unthinkable. Now, once again, the Jews in their little willful and judicial blindness could not see the real spiritual significance and truth behind Jesus' statements. So, Jesus' um, reference here to eating and drinking was not referring to the ordinance of communion, you know, uh, or two significant, for, um, for two significant reasons. One, Communion had not been instituted yet. So, you know, he wasn't talking about communion. And two, if Jesus was referring to communion, then the passage would teach their, teach that anyone partaking of communion will receive eternal life. You see what I'm saying? So he wasn't talking about that when he was telling them to eat and drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. 
When many of the disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? So they didn't even want to hear what Jesus had to say anymore. Because what he was saying was just pretty ridiculous. You know, so... And so, like I said, these verses was going to constitute the reaction of Jesus' disciples to his, to his sermon of real life. Now, we're not talking about the 12 disciples. Everybody that was listening, everybody that was there getting taught is a disciple. And so, um, so the reaction of Jesus' disciples to his sermon on the bread of life, as with the crowd's response in Jerusalem and in Galilee, the response of many of these disciples was unbelief. And therefore, they had a rejection of him. Now, John lists two groups. And their reactions. One, the false disciples' reaction um, of unbelief, which we're about to read now. And then two, the true disciples' reaction of belief. Now, after this sermon, only a small um, group of the disciples remained. A lot of them left them. And they, and they, and they, he was talking some nonsense. But Jesus, knowing himself that his disciples was grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? So his disciples were grumbling. Many of Jesus' disciples had the same reaction as the Jews uh, and of the first generation of Israelites to manna. They grumbled. So then Jesus said, then what if, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Now, the um, reminiscent of Jesus' word is Jesus' words like in, in chapter 2. Jesus knew the hearts of men. Remember we read this in chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. Jesus knew the heart of men, including those disciples who followed him. Now, he supernaturally knew that many did not believe in him as Messiah and Son of God, so he did not entrust himself to them. Remember, he did that in chapter 2. So these false disciples were simply attracted to the physical phenomena that he had, the miracles and, and the food, and they failed to understand the true significance of Jesus' teaching. They basically were trying to use him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. This is why he told him that although men and women are commanded to believe and will be held accountable um, for unbelief, genuine faith is never exclusively a matter of human decision. You know, that's why I kept teaching you can't just go seek God. On your own, God has put in your heart. Even even Romans three eleven says that no one seeks after God, no one understands. So, so once again, in the face of unbelief, Jesus reiterated God's sovereignty involved in selection for salvation. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Now, this language indicates that the abandonment was decisive and final. So that means they won't come back. He didn't choose them. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter asked him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. See, Peter got the memo. Peter knew what was up. Now where are we going to go? If you're saying you the one that give us life, well, where, where, where we get it from? No, we ain't going away. We good. We good right here. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter's words were somewhat pretentious um, in that he implied that the true disciple somehow had superior insight and as a result came to believe through that insight. And so Jesus answered him, did I not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? He did. He chose all 12 of them. See, this is what those people ain't paying attention to. God be showing you that he the one that chooses you to salvation because he chose the 12. And one of them betrayed him because that was his will. That was God's will for Judas. That's why he chose him. So in response to Peter's words that his disciples had come to believe in Jesus, he reminds them that he sovereignly chose them. That Jesus would not allow even a whisper of human um, pretension in God's sovereign selection. So they didn't make the choice of coming to follow Jesus. He chose them to follow him. And so he had to remind them of that. 
And so he said, Jesus said to him, did I not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? The devil means slanderer or false accuser, remember? So the, this idea perhaps is better rendered, one of you is the devil. This meaning it's clear from um, those verses in, um, in, uh, in this whole gospel, in this chapter, in Mark, in Luke, that the supreme adversary of God is the one that operates behind failing human beings, that his malice becomes theirs. So Jesus supernaturally knew the source and identity uh, and identified it precisely. Um, this, clearly, this clearly fixes the character that um, of Judas. You know, not as a, a, a well-intentioned, but, but misguided man trying to force Jesus to exert his power and set up his kingdom, as, as some people suggested, actually. But as a, he was a fool of Satan, doing wickedness on behalf of Satan. And he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, um, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Iscariot, this word is most likely is from a Hebrew word meaning man of um, Kerioth. This is the name of a village in Judah. And um, as with the other three Gospels, as soon as he was named, he became identified as the betrayer. Um, as soon as he was named, <laughs> they, they identify him as a betrayer. That's terrible. So after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. So the main um the main thrust in this, this section um can be su summarized as high intensity hatred. You know, um since since they had such a a, a smoldering dislike for Jesus, you know, and so. So it, it it erupted. It just that the anger just became blazing, like the the hate that the so much hatred occurred, um, uh, where the Jewish authorities plot to kill Jesus. Um, that's when they started, you know, coming up with the idea of crucifying him. So both chapters, um, that we're you know we're reading deals with Jesus. As the feast at the feast of booths or tabernacles in Jerusalem, especially, um, it's the fact that two major themes associated with the tabernacles, which is the water and the light. Um, so then at the next year, at the Passover, following the celebration of the tabernacles, Jesus, Jesus, that's when Jesus was crucified. Um, The central truth this that, that that dominates this whole passage is that Jesus was, was on a divine timetable. And so his life was not random, but it was operated according to God's sovereign and perfect timing and direction. So when you look at so um that was me reading John chapter seven too. I was in the next chapter, but I'm gonna stop right here. Because we finished out six. I ain't know we went through 71 verses like that. Yeah. I was like, wait a minute, we're going into seven. Yeah. So we done. If y'all have any questions, go ahead on. Them. Let it rip. So we keep going. I mean, seriously, I was like, okay, and what's the next one? How long is that's because um seven is long too. Oh so that's why I'm doing one chapter at a time. Oh yeah. Yeah, all that John is John has some long chapters. Mm -hmm. But they're good. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're good to get into you know, help you develop everything the audacity of those Jews yeah those Jews are so amazing those Jews are so amazing like they was a mess they were oh. and, the, yeah. and the thing is is that's who Jesus came for mm -hmm. I, I didn't you know and it's like God like Lord and I chose them oh 
Because they was a piece of wood. But they're going to get it right. Unfortunately, they're going to have to learn the hard way. Yep. But that's what it's, it's, it's going to take. I have a question. So when with Jesus saying, um, did I not um did I not choose you the twelve and yet one of you is the devil? Like he chose Judas for that purpose? Like he knew he chose Judas for the purpose? Okay. Yeah, Let's because everything is a, is on God's timing. Mm-hmm. And um and then you have to and at the same time, God is actually showing you that who is not truly with him. You know that wow. scripture that having a form of godless with the nine of power thereof, you have to see it in action. Mm-hmm. You know, and so when and when we talk about people that claim like professing Christians to be claiming salvation, and then they walk away, Judas, re, Judas also represented the parable of the sea souls. Mm-hmm. You know, Judas represent um those who, you know, those professing Christians that really won't, you know, uh, the lower, lower Christian that Jesus was talking about, stuff like that. Judas represent all. You need to see somebody that actually represented that. But everything is on God's time, and in order for these things that God called to happen, like if 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 Judas wouldn't have betrayed him, mm-hmm. he would have never got to that cross. Oh, you right. know, and so and and this is God's uh, this is God's sovereign will for him to get on that cross. Somebody got to help get him on that cross. And he has to suffer the same way that people that was doing wicked in that time suffered. And somebody ain't remember. You know, they got the thing where you got out of the mouth of two or three witnesses being fast, the mouth of two, three witnesses uh, convict people of sin. They still had to follow that same way that they did in that time. And you know people betrayed folks in the Bible, so he was just doing what, what people do. Mm-hmm. But 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 Judas needed to be around him so he could know his schedule. So mm. you could so he could know God's timing. He needs he needs somebody that's an inside job. Mm. So he needed him to be able to find Jesus on that right timing. It had to be somebody that knew his schedule. Oh, G, you know, Jesus used to go over there at the mountain there and so and so this time of night, you know what I mean? So you could right. be able to get right to him. You gotta be trying to find him because you know his routine. Because That's Jesus already knew his heart and everything, yeah. right? So, like, yeah, yeah okay. Gotcha. Yep. So it makes sense to use somebody in, on the inside that can um make sure the timing, because it's just the thing, you know, everything is on God's timing. If God wanted Jesus to be done on this day, how was it going to find him? Is some, you know, how was it just going to find him? Because Jesus dipped out all the time. He was always traveling here, always traveling here, but he still had the same routine. Somebody in the inside needed to know that routine so he could get those people there. So there's so many reasons why God knew that Judas was going to betray him, but he also needed Judas to betray him. So he needed somebody in the inside to betray him so he could be able to find him. He'd be chasing the joint, staking out. Well, you know, this is scheduled right here. At 1 o'clock, he'd be at work, but then he'd leave for lunch and go to this hotel and so on. So so Judas knew all that stuff. So you know, yeah, I can find him. We're gonna find him. He's gonna be right here at this time, you know. But versus somebody not in the group, they it would they would have been having an all off. She's probably got would have got crucified about weeks later after God had um ordained it, you know, because no one inside knew exactly how to find him. So you need somebody, you need somebody on the inside. Ooh, can you imagine eating with somebody that you know is gonna turn you? I mean, just being, you have to be nice to him. Mm. And he washed his feet. Oh. I would have, it couldn't have been one of us. We probably would have shot his foot off like we, they did on roots. I think they I would have kicked, kicked, him, in the, kicked <laughs> him in the face while he was washing the feet. <laughs> I'm like, I'm washing a little feet. Go on and sit over there and wait for me. I get through the best on You know, you, yeah. that's why you, it wouldn't have been, it couldn't have been on us. I'm like, ain't God, no, you know, I ain't washing his feet. <laughs> Say what? He knew mm-hmm. who to choose. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it could have been one of us. Oh, so you gonna have me watch his feet? And you know he gonna he the reason I'm about to go up on his cross. Wow. That's God indicating how you still got love your enemies. Yeah. Because the reason why you love your enemies, it's a shame. Was Judas mm-hmm. not shamed? Yep. 
Yeah. Yep. All right, Melissa, have a good one, love. Hey. <laughs> so yeah, that's um that's the purpose. So he shamed Judas because boy, Judas got Judas felt so bad and ended up, you know, committing suicide. So and he won't ever call to salvation anyway. He was called to do that particular task. Oh yeah. yeah. That's a messed up situation to be in to be called to be evil. Ooh. Mm. That's I mean the thing about it is you going you was gonna be evil anyway. Why not God like I just use them then? Use a little evil butt to com accomplish my goal. That's why I was telling people in that video I did with their past. I said, God will use you, even if you're wicked, to accomplish his goal. Yeah. But you know as well, it's just even thinking like, dang, I was chosen just to do these evil deeds. Like, that's what. <laughs> Right. And it's not necessarily that you was chosen to actually do the evil deed. Because remember, God knows the heart of man. He knew he was going to uh -huh. be evil just I was going to use him. Because he, he'll That's do what, what I need saying. to be done. Like, like, he know, like he knows when you, before you even come into this world, yeah. they're going to be evil. They're going to be wicked. And just, just knowing like, dang, I was wicked from the beginning. Like, right. That's a wild thought to think like, dang, I was here just to be with, you know what I'm saying? Like I wasn't chosen. I was just here as an example of what wickedness looked like. Like, but he didn't, And the thing is, he probably didn't even know that. I know. I'm just saying like, if dude, if he could be on the outside looking in, like, mm -hmm. dang, that's, <laughs> that's why. He just ain't even calling me to spend heaven with you, huh, guys? And it shows me just, just be wicked. Like he chose Saul. Love you too, Shannon. Yeah, I'm about to do the same thing. <laughs>